So today I'm speaking with Lynn Fraser. Hi Lynn, thank you for, for joining, joining me for this okay. interview. Thank you for having me, I'm excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too, me too. Um, so Lynn, I, um, you're, a, you're a therapist and a meditation teacher, you work with people with trauma. And one of the, as I, as you know, one of the inspirations for doing this series of interviews is really to speak to people who've both, who have both a spiritual journey and a healing journey, and to see how how that has kind of played along and into each other in terms of those journeys and. So I'd like to start with the spiritual journey, though. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could we could start with you telling us how how that all got started for you and how it unfolded, um, relatively briefly. But you know, just to give people a sense of where you're coming from. Right, right. I think probably the kind of the formal start of my spiritual practice and journey was in the early 90s i took a meditation course and i was working with an aids organization at the time really stressed i'd been with them for seven years and it was an intense environment to work in in the 80s especially um and so i, I took this course and shortly after that i i ended up taking some time off of work and leaving that job and so i had time and i loved i felt like i had come home the first class i took and we would listen to cassette tapes at the time of um, Swami Veda, the meditation teacher. And so it was a Western woman, Ginger Kunis, who I was taking the classes with. And we would talk about, and she would be playing these recordings on super conscious meditation and on yoga philosophy, which I was always just so fascinated in, not just the meditation practice, but how does that work in our life? And so over, you know, several months, I, I just really got focused in on reading books and, but in particular doing practice. And at that time too, there was a, a weekly um, meditation satsang and um, I just started to do a daily practice and started to work with my breath and started to understand a bit more about the mind. A few months into that process, I had a, uh, an incident at work where I just realized that I could breathe and take a moment. And that was like, wow, I don't even know how to meditate yet, but just taking a breath was enough to center me and give me some options that I couldn't see before. So that was really inspiring as well. And then for several years, I had, um, there was a lot of activity we would bring in uh, you know, the meditation teacher and another teacher. And uh, I had a lot of opportunities to to work with that and really go deep and establish a strong meditation practice in the company of of teachers and students. And, and um, I got involved in, in organizing a teacher training program and was able to work with some really experienced yoga and meditation teachers. And... Um, over time, it just I just kept going deeper and deeper into it. I went to India. I was going to the U.S. a lot for retreats, and I really felt like this was what really made sense to me. I felt like I was all of the you know I had done therapy and I had done a bunch of different things to work on the healing side of things, but through these practices, I was starting to really know um, myself on a deeper level and to have more stillness in my mind. I had a lot of catastrophic thinking and really mm -hmm. compulsive um, thinking. And it was really helpful to, you know, I just started doing yoga and started teaching yoga as well and meditation. And, mm -hmm. and so that was, you know, over 25 years ago now. And so Lynn, can I ask you, uh, I'm not uh, um, aware of Swami Veda. So um, is that the yogic tradition? Broadly it's a speaking, yoga, yeah, the yogic tradition, and he it was Swami Rama of the Himalayas and the Himalayan Institute in Honesdale and the Yoga mm -hmm. International magazine. Some people probably would be more familiar with that, 
um, but it's a Raja Yoga royal, so it'd be similar in philosophy to Shivananda and, mm-hmm. and the other uh, yoga teachers who came to the West. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, the, the eight rungs of yoga, which include Hatha Yoga, and then, you know, concentration and, and meditation and mm-hmm. going to Samadhi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so since this made sense to you, did you, um, did you buy into this idea that you have to practice hard to eventually, maybe in this lifetime, maybe in another lifetime, reach enlightenment? I mean, is that something that was present to you as a goal? Does did that right. get you kind of searching? in a particular way? Not really. You know, I felt like I was, um, like for one thing, it was really clear, like the instructions were really clear, don't don't go seeking for bliss experiences. Bliss mm-hmm. experiences are not the point of meditation. <laughs> and that they are helpful and enjoyable. And, you know, part of what we're doing when we practice is we we open ourselves to those. And if it happens, then, that's great. You can enjoy them, and but just don't get attached to them. So there's a lot of stuff around attachment, a lot of stuff around healing the nervous system so that we could actually have a body and a nervous system that was healthy enough to, to go into meditation. And a lot of what I learned was about my mind and mm-hmm. what's going on in my mind that prevents me from staying in a deeper connection with myself or going into meditation. And usually it was just a, a, a junk mail list of thoughts that were in the mind. And as I started to work, I, that's why I like the philosophy and the psychology of it so much. But I did, you know, I was introduced, of course, to reincarnation and all kinds of, you know, deeper ways of, of experiencing and of thinking or contextualizing our experience. But it was never, um, I never really came into that. I want more or it wasn't that I didn't want more. It's just that I I had a lot, I have a lot of trust that all I really needed to do was work with my mantra. It's a mantra meditation tradition Mm -hmm. and, and work with the obstacles, letting go of the obstacles to knowing who I am and to meditation. Mm -hmm. And over time that just started to dissolve a lot of the chaos in the mind and, I had more stability. I wasn't as reactive. So there was a real body. There was something going on in the body as well as the mind. And then when I would have those, you know, deeper experiences, um, I could really see, you know, like, so if you have an experience and then, and then you start to kind of get into that level again, and then your mind goes, Oh, here it is. (laughs) And then you're right out of it again. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I could really verify for myself that, in fact, the instructions on not being attached attached to consciousness states was a good idea. It it really mm-hmm. doesn't work well. We can't obsess about trying to get somewhere and actually get mm-hmm. there. Yeah. You know, then as as I'm listening to this, I'm, as I'm hearing this, I'm really struck by how um, how wise guidance can be so important. It really is. Because, you know, my own experience was that I started with meditation too because I was stressed out. And my very first meditation in that first class got very blissful. Uh, And it really got me hooked. mm -hmm. And I was in a Western Buddhist context Mm -hmm. of people who weren't immersed enough in the depths of the tradition Mm -hmm. to really guard against, you know, some of these, some of the seeking. So I got hooked. I just wanted more blissful experiences. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what, that's what I was after. Um, So I'm just struck that, you know, wise guidance and of course, in the yogic tradition, this guidance is thousands of years old. Right. You know, they yeah. really do know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that can be so helpful. 
you know, yeah. because because it, it it kind of points to some of the pitfalls and say, just just don't go for that. Yeah. 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 Just don't get attached to the bliss. Don't get attached to that. Yeah. And Swami Veda was very loving. And um, I think part of what happened there was he created, a, he would never have called it a safe space, but he felt very safe for me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was always kind of about tune your receiver and then you'll be able to get the signal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our work as individual, you know, to do our own practice and to work with our mind and, you know, to have a, a lifestyle that supports that. And, and then we just really surrender. It doesn't really matter so much what happens. And I remember being in a, I did a lot of service in that tradition. So, you know, mm -hmm. working with organizing things and, and that gave me the opportunity to be around these teachers. Uh, Pandit DeBrawl was another one who moved to Calgary, actually, where I lived at the time. And just spending time with him, it's such a clarity of mind. Mm -hmm. And his nervous system was still, his mind was still. And I could just be there and kind of see firsthand what it was like when something would come along to ruffle everybody up. And one time I was sitting with Swami Veda and just talking with him alone. He didn't very often talk to them alone, but uh, I was having like an interview with him and, and we were talking and I was so struck by his presence and not in kind of a glamorous way, just a very quiet, I could tell that as I was speaking with him, he was just listening mm -hmm. and he wasn't, it wasn't triggering other thoughts in his mind. You know, he was actually just there mm -hmm. and, and that's inspiring to, to be able to actually be around someone who's just present. Mm -hmm. And so I had some really great kind of role models if you, if you want, but also, you know, the energy field of, of someone whose mind is very still mm -hmm. can really help us come to more stillness. And so that was part of, you know, I think that's part of spiritual seeking often is we, 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 experience that energy field when we're around someone who has that and mm -hmm. then we want more of it mm -hmm. and so you know what i did was i put myself in the in the arena so that i could experience that but there was always so much uh love lovely you know heart center meditations and lovely inspirations and you know this is here this is our true nature Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do anything or go anywhere to get it. So I don't think I ever heard the word non-dual, but that's mm -hmm. actually what it is, you know. Yes, yes. How can you discover? Yeah. And you know, over a period of time, I just I really fell in love with myself, not the small ass self, but just there was just so much opening and love and connection mm -hmm. and and then I could go deeper into meditation and experience for myself what was there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the teachings are things like, you know, if you, if you look at the Western culture, there's the, you know, there's this feeling there's something really wrong with us. Whereas in the Eastern cultures, it's like we're at our core, we're divine. And the only thing that prevents us from knowing that is just these things that obscure it. And so we could just work on, on reducing the things that obscure it and there we are yes yes um can i just lynn it's, it's such an important point and you know the dalai lama has said to yes. have been very surprised at just how self-hating western people are mm -hmm. you know because really you don't find that in the east in the same yeah. way yeah. no um I think a lot of that has to do with, um, like I'm pretty sure that the church hasn't always interpreted Jesus' teachings in a very pure way, but the whole concept of original sin, and then so many people in our culture are damaged by the religious upbringing, and it doesn't have to be that way. I don't believe that that's actually the teachings, but no. you know, we can sure see the, the impact on people. And then, and then we bring it to bring in the trauma piece. 
when children are in some kind of a situation where they're being hurt or neglected or abused, then it's a natural part of the part of our survival system to think to ourselves, well, what could I do to make it better? And part of that is that we turn against ourselves and we think, well, if I'm not being treated with love, it must be because I'm unlovable. So I need to do something different. I need mm -hmm. to become something else other than mm -hmm. what I am. And that creates yeah. such a deep feeling of unworthiness and there's something wrong yes. with me. And that's not something that we really see so much in the Eastern cultures that, that knowing that our, our core is divine mm. is stable in a lot of those cultures. Lynn, you know, I'm, it's, you, you're mentioning so many things that I want to kind of, you know, engage with you about. Um, and maybe we can come back to the, to the trauma and the self, you know, self-judgment, self-hating, self-negativity um, uh, that's there in the West. Maybe we can come back to that when we talk about the healing and the spiritual mm -hmm. journey. Sure. Um, there was something that, that I really feel, uh, it's so important, you know, in a spiritual journey, like you said, that we come across people who don't just talk the right talk, but actually are what they talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so uh, this that there's a kind of energetic transmission that happens that way. Right. You know, we get mm -hmm. it in a way that's not in the mind. Right, it's not verbal. Yeah, yeah. it's not a, it's a, you know, we just feel the presence and the, the, the peace and the, you know, the essential um, silence, stillness that's there in in these in these teachers. Mm -hmm. And. You know, sometimes I wonder how much of our actual spiritual um, journey is really about finding people who, from whom we can get that rather than all the other teachings, you know, the, right. the, the, the more verbally transmitted teachings. Right, right. Because from what I hear from you, it's like, it's really having been with teachers who embodied that, mm, what they much. spoke of, you know, that left the biggest impression. Mm -hmm. In addition to the other teachings that made sense to you, but somehow it's like, you know, this kind of almost like, um, uh, getting it in our bones, you know, in our being, mm. in our bodies, you know, this kind of, ah, yeah, it's actually possible to be like that. Yes, I don't think we can um, underestimate how important that is. I think that's really mm. important. And, you know, in the tradition that, I, that I'm in with Swami Veda, in particular his teachings, it's very practical. Like one of the quotes he had was, the greatest gift you can give the world is a peaceful mind. Mm -hmm. So it was always, it, meditation was never something that we escaped into. It was mm -hmm. always, yes, we need to learn meditation and, and to learn to work skillfully with the mind and, and thoughts and understand what's going on and all of that. And we need a meditation practice, you know, lots of yoga nidra and different really deep relaxations in the body and in the mind. And, and we need to, to do those so that we can have that awareness that that's who we really are without in any way saying I'm not the body. Because obviously I have a body and I have personal experience and, and life is happening through this body. And so I think having that grounded approach in those really formative years when I was just learning and and really deep into meditating and and 
now I don't have in-person connection with my teachers anymore. And so, but I have that groundedness. So I think that also protected me from like knowing what it feels like to be with someone who has that kind of presence. Mm -hmm. If, if somebody was just talking about it, I could just tell, I could feel the difference. Mm -hmm. And so I think that actually helped to inoculate me against being drawn to that too, which is mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what happened after that initial period of being immersed in that Sangha and those teachings? How did that unfold for you? After? Well, it was actually kind of a, a part of it, part of, part of the disconnection or the, the lack of in-person stuff happened when I moved here uh, in 2012, eight mm -hmm. years ago. But it was happening before that as well. Um, so the real spiritual head of the tradition, Swami Rama, had left his body in 98. And, and so that, um, that creates a certain disruption in the tradition. Mm -hmm. right and he had several kind of leading teachers Swami Veda was one of them and uh, and different people and there was just some troubled energy in in the whole tradition and so some of that kind of came down and um, the teacher that we had in Calgary um, the the for original Western woman that I taught that I learned from and the Indian teacher mm -hmm. as well there was just a lot of kind of currents of things that were going on and things weren't as cohesive as they were before. It, it got to be, you know, there was some, I, I en ended up leaving the Western teacher. She just, um, we just weren't, weren't, weren't a good match anymore. Mm -hmm. and so, so that was kind of like the honeymoon was over and the honeymoon lasted a lot of a long time, like mm -hmm. 10 or 12 years or something. Right. But eventually in, in 2004, really that all started to come to a head. And, and so, there wasn't the weekly group anymore. There wasn't that cohesive support. Mm -hmm. uh, but by that time, you know, I was teaching yoga and meditation part time. And, you know, I was really connected with certain people. So I really felt like I was still fine, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and it was a more mature place. Like it was really much more my own practice. And as I, you know, healed my nervous system more and was able to really be present with myself in a different way. That was very helpful. And then in 2004 and 2005, I had two really big things happen that really kind of knocked me. I won't say they knocked me off kilter, but they were pretty big disruptions. And one is that in 2004, my son was misdiagnosed with a form of cancer that was, would have killed him, killed everybody within two years. Mm -hmm. And so I had, we had nine weeks before they discovered it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. So I went into a real deep period of, of, of looking at his childhood, my childhood, a lot of disruption there. And a year after that, um, I was assaulted when I was on my way to work. I was riding my bicycle to work and I was physically assaulted by somebody mm -hmm. and ended up with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so those two things revealed a lot about what had healed and, you know, I had a lot of stability in my system. I was able to really use the practices and I wasn't able to meditate for a long time because my mind was too disturbed, mm -hmm. but I was able to do yoga nidra and do practices and to establish more safety again in my nervous system. And can, you, can you just mention to people who, who are not um, aware of yoga nidra, what, what you're referring to? So yoga nidra is a, 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 a brainwave state and we get to it by deep relaxation practices. So some of them are practices like blue star or sweeping breath or just anything that really allows our nervous system to come into a state of rest, almost like you're going to go to sleep. Mm. So your mind is very awake and alert and deeply still. And, and so those practices, some of them we would see at the end of a yoga class when we do the Shavasana practices. Um, and when we get kind of skilled at that, then we're able to access that, that state of calm, mm -hmm. alert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a lot of what I was doing as I was healing from the PTSD uh, mm -hmm. and doing a number of other things too, to feel safe and that kind of thing. Um, 
and then after that there was a period of time when you know i wasn't really meditating as much as i used to um but there was also a period where i just kind of felt like things were getting integrated on a different level mm -hmm. and i didn't have to do a lot of sitting meditation because a lot of the things that had disturbed my mind before and taken me out of stillness weren't really there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have to, you know, when I first started, it would take me 15 minutes to just relax my shoulders, you know? Yeah. And after a while you become, your nervous system experiences breathing deeply and being more relaxed. And in 2004, when we had that misdiagnosis, I had, you know, I'd been, pretty relaxed in my body before that. And then I would notice I was, my shoulders were up around my ears and then I'd relax them and then there they go again. And mm -hmm. I went through that dozens of times every day. Mm -hmm. And so we learn a lot about ourselves when we go through something like that. And the catastrophic oh, sure. thinking that was in my mind and, you know, what's going to happen now and in, you know, three months and, and two years and, and 20 years later, 10 years later. And my, I could just see the chaos in my mind. Mm -hmm. And yet there was also coming back to stillness. Mm -hmm. And so to I, I got to know myself in a really deep, a lot of deep depth there that hadn't, hadn't maybe been tested before. Mm -hmm. I got to work with all of that. Yeah. And that left me in a very different place by the end of all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how life kind of presents us with opportunities to really go deeper with it does where we've gotten to you know like in my own life i had two episodes of cancer mm -hmm. and it brought up not the first one but the second one first one brought up other stuff but the second one really brought up fear of death ah, right and i didn't think i i had that in me somehow you know mm -hmm. And here it was, and it was intense right. for a while, for a few weeks until, yeah. you know, somehow that had been met. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and you know, I knew, I knew how to, my mind, at, in a way, was able to be very still. And yet, in the face of that fear, right. it had to find stillness in a whole new way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it, it had to go so much deeper and so much it had to become just so much more full right right and the only way that it can do that is by meeting something that's way stronger than what we've met before mm -hmm. almost yeah. you know it's like the challenge has to be yeah bigger and stronger and more powerful and more right. deeper and you know mm -hmm. just more of what we've already faced mm -hmm. because that's the only way that 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 things can integrate even more deeply yes fully we need to kind of stir things up sometimes <laughs> before we can let that all kind of reveal itself but you know we live in mammal bodies and we have nervous systems and primitive brains that are really committed to keeping this body alive yeah and, and that kind of fear is natural so to be able to work with it without i mean we all have resistance mm -hmm. to be able to see our resistance and go okay what does this mean that all of a sudden i'm like this or that i have these waves of fear or yeah you know that we have these emotional flashbacks to how we felt before and even though we understand it in our mind, we mm -hmm. still are dealing with the impact of that in our body, our nervous system. And when we can't access the stillness that we're used to, because we have these disturbances in the mind, then we really don't have a lot of choice. We kind of have to work with it. Yeah. 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 Good thing, too. Doesn't feel like that at the time, but you know. Doesn't, no. Um, no. Oh. Really, and that's whether we how look we at grow. that as burning karma or or whatever, however we look at it, it's still it's just where that's what's going on right now. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I love about my life now, and about you know, it's kind of the healing work that I've done, is that I'm really interested in and able to work with whatever comes up. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm not really scared of what I might find out because I've done a lot of healing work. I pretty much know what's going on. Mm-hmm. But also, I don't resist what comes and goes the way I used to. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in the spiritual path, we have a lot of feeling like, well, I need to have calmness and stillness in my mind. And how am I going to get there? I'm not going to think about that stuff. Or, you know, we suppress it instead of mm-hmm. allowing it to just be there and flow through. And that takes a certain amount of practice and experience to know that when we can touch into the stillness that's there, it never really goes away. We might have lost sight of it a little bit, but it's always Mm -hmm. there. Yes, but that's really already a state of maturity in the spiritual Mm-hmm. journey isn't it when we come to a place of knowing that you know that stillness never leaves it's right. just that we get distracted from it by our own minds and our bodies you know kind of the nervous system acting up and um that's that's a pretty mature state you know and there's a lot of freedom yes when we get to that Mm-hmm. realization and yeah. so for me it doesn't matter so much um, about bliss experiences it matters more about daily life experience so if mm-hmm. I can use the circumstances of daily life to continue to work with my mind and to to really know on a deep level that even if there's activity in the mind I can still be aware of the stillness mm-hmm. then that's that's all I really care about I don't really care about so, you know so much the other although although you know i won't even i won't even say it, i don't think that's 100 percent true i think what it is is that sometimes those bliss experiences or the experience of knowing the stillness mm-hmm. however that is whether it's blissful or quiet or whatever it is mm-hmm. i think those are actually very important to know and there's been times when mm-hmm. i've been kind of in a desert of not feeling very juicy with my practice when i could just think back to that and I could remember and I know that's here too so even Mm -hmm. though right now it's pretty obscured I know that that's here because I've experienced that directly and Mm -hmm. and I think that's actually very encouraging and very helpful not to try and kind of get back to it but just to know yeah I do know that that's Mm -hmm. helpful too yeah yeah so um <clears throat> would it be skipping ahead to um ask you about scott killaby's uh mm-hmm. inquiries and how yeah. you got into those or is that is that they're a bit in between that the, no it's part of that um it, i met scott at a time when i was in a desert kind of i was in a relationship that was going to be over in a couple of years and things were pretty tough and my mother was in a process of dying and um, a lot of pressure in my personal life and a friend Jerry Katz who you know I'm sure and uh, (laughs) Jerry is a friend of my son's here in Halifax Mm -hmm. and he said hey Scott and I are both going to be out near Calgary south of Calgary why don't you come Mm -hmm. and it was a conference in Lethbridge and I went down there and I met Scott and a bunch of other great people and hung out with Jerry a bit it was really fun and then was that the non-dual conference that yeah, the one that was yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and and i liked him you know i could really feel the stillness in scott mm-hmm. and he was just doing kind of online satsangs a little bit at the time and i took some you know six eight week courses with him and then my mother died and a whole bunch of things happened in the family and I did some private personal like one-on-one work with him a little bit which really helped Mm -hmm. and then I was so I left my partner and as I was driving out to Nova Scotia I got an email from Scott saying I'm doing living inquiries training are you interested Mm -hmm. I'm like yeah and then I'm thinking oh this this bad timing I've just left this 30-year relationship I'm kind of in chaos emotionally I don't even know if I'll have my stuff in the apartment but you know that something in me just said yeah you should do this so i did Mm -hmm. and uh, the training and then i was still working um 
remotely at the time, so I didn't have a lot of time for it. But mostly I was healing my own trauma at, mm -hmm. at, during those couple of years. And the living inquiries were a really big part of that. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went to the Kilby Center for Recovery when he started that a couple of times and did some one-on-one -on -one work with Scott for a couple of weeks at uh, two different times and started learning about developmental trauma from Gabor Mate and different people mm -hmm. and started really healing the developmental trauma. Um, and then from there, I just, you know, as, as my other work kind of petered out, I just increased the amount of time I was... I was working with individuals and, and, and groups. And over that, so since about probably 2014, so six years now, mm -hmm. uh, I just started putting more and more of my energy into this work that I do with people. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I didn't exactly retire from my other job because this kind of came along. But I've just really found it to be, um, it's, that, it's that other piece of, of really working in the body to release the stored trauma and mm -hmm. to understand and the Killaby inquiries aren't aren't um aren't really meant to focus on trauma necessarily so i brought in all of what i knew about teaching meditation and and um the deep relaxation what's happening in the nervous system as well as what i was learning mm -hmm. about developmental trauma and so i've kind of combined all of those now into the work that i do mm -hmm. so yeah scott's been a big part of what i've been doing and then also the radical recovery summit uh, since 2017, I've been, uh, that's presented mm -hmm. by the Philippi Center, and I do, you know, I find the people, I do the yeah, interviews, do the interviews. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, do all of that. So that's been a, a wonderful piece of this work as well. Mm. Would you consider Scott a teacher? Um, I learn, I've learned a lot from Scott, and I don't consider him my teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm, I feel very close and connected with Scott. Um, but my teachers are still in the meditation tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What makes somebody? How How do you How do you know whether somebody's your teacher or not? I I know that's a, maybe a, a funny question, but you know, people. I find people need to know. Right. I think that it's, there's a clarity about teachers that's yeah. not just mental. Right. I think that there's um, like, I really feel fortunate to have found the teachers that I did um, and to have a tradition or a lineage where there's someone keeping an eye on the teachers. Mm -hmm. I think that's very helpful too. And I think that's a lot of Western teachers don't have that. Um, mm -hmm. So what was happening for me in that first, you know, probably not year one, two, but maybe year three, four, five up to year 10 or something like that was my heart was opening. I was really, I was falling in love and I felt that and it was just there was such a, a juiciness and a flow to that and it's really easy to think that that's your teacher who's who's doing that and you know as much love and affection as I had for my teachers it was always really made clear to me that number one there were they had the boundaries I didn't have to keep the boundaries they did and so there was never any, ever any question of sexual impropriety or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I could safely just love them and love myself. And I knew that I wasn't going to be manipulated or abused. But having said that, we all bring this um, magical thinking. We bring our, the holes in our hearts. We bring our unhealed trauma and that's why I think it's very important for the teachers to have the clarity, you know, and, and in our tradition too, we, there's a lot of encouragement to, <clears throat> to really be a good student in terms of discerning and not just following like a sheep. Okay. And tell me one was it. I don't want sheep in my, mm -hmm. I just want you to be really present and aware and, and keep working with this. Is this actually working for you is this true you know mm -hmm. don't just mm -hmm. blindly follow along with somebody mm -hmm. so there was a lot of that kind of really practical but you know you have such love for these people because it's it they're connected with this heart opening of ours yeah. and because they're wonderful people usually you know mm -hmm. and so i i just feel really um really blessed to have had had that experience where I didn't have to be the one that was keeping the boundaries because they were being kept by the lineage of teachers 
and there was a lot of senior teachers around uh, Americans as well as from India who who were we were connected as a group and you know there were several psychologists in the group there was just a lot of really wise people so if you ever had a question you could always go to somebody and say mm -hmm. you know this is what's coming up for me and they would be able to help with that um, and they could see it if somebody if a teacher was starting to go off the rails they could see it and they would challenge it and say you mm -hmm. know there's a lot of ego here um, mm -hmm. you know and work with them on that so I, I think that's something that would be wonderful if if more people had that and mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's always really all that stable yes well, you know, I, what's happened is that there's a lot of teachers in the West who aren't really part of a tradition. Yeah, it's, it's usually... Especially in the non-dual kind of circles, you know. So uh, what you're describing, what was there for teachers was really a structure yeah. that that had more senior and more experienced and hopefully more mature people hmm. um, who would who would kind of notice what was happening and who would be available as people to talk to if you know there were questions or issues mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of you know maybe part of the Western individualism also that those structures are not necessarily created, you know? Yes. That there's a lot of people who just aren't part of a structure right. like that, of a yeah. school, of a, yeah. you know, of a lineage. Right. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think there's some, I sense, you know, partly from watching Scott and different people, um, there is some sense of of peer support and challenge sometimes it's amongst mm -hmm. a, a level of people. So mm -hmm. you know, I I think that sometimes you know if 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 somebody looks like they're really going off the rails, other senior teachers will in just in the non dual world will will go to them and say, "Hey, mm -hmm. what's going on with this?" Mm -hmm. you know? I know a lot of people have come to Scott and said. This is what's going on with this teacher. Can you help me, or can you help me make sense of that? Or, um, and you know, there's a lot of there's a new um, organization now around spiritual ethics mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that Rich Archer is part of that. Um, mm -hmm. Rich Archer. And Richard Miller is another one who's who's really worked with yoga therapy and with mm -hmm. and with non dual teachers as well. So there are a lot of really good, solid, stable teachers, mm -hmm. and and there are some that i think do some harm and you know for me now having um you know i noticed it right away when i started to teach meditation i wasn't that many years i was only like five five years into my practice maybe and but i had guidance mm -hmm. but i also had the example of you know what is my role as someone who's mentoring other people or mm -hmm. or helping to guide other people and it's really, really important to me. And it's certainly important with the people that I work with that are healing trauma mm -hmm. to be safe mm -hmm. and to not be using people for my own um, ego stroking or anything like that, to really stay mm -hmm. grounded and centered and, and humble and, and to not, not think that I'm the one who's gonna save them or something like that, because those things are such a trap. Mm -hmm. And so partly, you know, I think Scott's really um, being helpful with that too. Like he really, he doesn't want to be anybody's guru. He doesn't want anybody to be kind of thinking about that. And in, in his organization, he's really, you know, he's, mm -hmm. we talk about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful too. I mean, it's got to be part of a teacher training. It is. Know? And it's right in the teacher training. Yeah. And not to build dependency. Okay, so how do you not build dependency? And, and that's very much front and center in Scott's work, which I really admire and respect that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I mean, Scott is not really part of any tradition. You know, he's really, he's, not, no. No. he's really come up with his 
teachings and his kind of inquiries pretty much by himself. And he talks about Greg Good as being a major influence, the, the type of inquiry Greg does. Okay. You know, I know he's being connected with Ajashanti and different people. Mm -hmm. So he's being connected, but you're right, the kind of inquiry that he does, uh, a lot of it is through his own experimentation, his own inquiry, his own depth. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not, you know, for him to have gone and started the Killaby Center and worked with addiction, he's learned so much. I mean, that's real boots on the ground kind of work. Yeah. And how does the mind work? How does compulsion work? How, how, you know, what's the role of trauma? And, the, you know, the methods of recovery that he's come up with and the tools to help people who are not in the non-dual world mm -hmm. to heal is, is really helpful for all of us, whether we're in the non-dual world or not, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Lynn, it's, it's such a... Um, I'd say that somebody like Scott is a perfect example why you wouldn't want everybody to be in a lineage, you know, yeah. because he really, you know, his teaching is so individual and so, you know, just also reflecting his own journey and his right. own need to, to heal. And, you know, I mean, he was dealing with addiction. So, right. Right. um, that's that's flowed into the work that he's doing with people and mm -hmm. you wouldn't you know if he were part of a tradition i don't know maybe he'd be doing something very different you know it's like yeah my mm -hmm. sense is really in the west the strength of individual teachers just coming out and teaching what they teach is that it's actually a real gift mm -hmm. And, and it creates a, a diversity, you know, of offerings and, and ways that people can connect spiritually. Right, it does. That, yeah. that really is, you know, it's a real wealth. It's a real richness mm -hmm. in that. And at the same time, you know, there is this side of it that means teachers aren't part of a lineage and there isn't the checks and balances that are part of that you know but then you look at the shambhala and chogun Prampa and now the sakyam mipam i mean that's a really good example and pema Chodron yes. just came out really publicly a month or so ago and said this isn't cool with me i'm it's not mm -hmm. business as usual and i'm withdrawing from shambhala Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. she came out on Facebook with a letter to the Shambhala board mm -hmm. and uh, resigning from participation in the Shambhala tradition. Mm -hmm. She's still teaching, but she's mm -hmm. no longer associated. And she, and she said, this isn't, this isn't something that you could just kind of put on pause for a couple of years and then, and then just come back business as usual. Like, this isn't okay. Mm -hmm. And so even within that structure there's a tradition if the head of the tradition is the one that's doing the problem problem behavior mm -hmm. then sometimes the the structure around that we've seen that with so many spiritual teachers yes in the West too, yes right? yeah. so i think you know part of the message is to really try to be um discerning and really not just be kind of a follower we need to you know, the practices that we're doing need to work. They need to be of some benefit. So we need to find a tradition or a teaching or a teacher or something that resonates with us mm -hmm. and, and that we can learn to trust ourselves. I mean, that's a big, uh, you know, one of the effects of trauma that Gabor Mate talks about is that we disconnect from ourselves. Yes. And as we connect with ourselves again, then we can trust ourselves mm -hmm. and we're not as susceptible Mm -hmm. to other people's ego or, or or pressure or whatever that might be and that's really yeah. the emotional maturity when we know and trust ourselves and we mm -hmm. we are on our own side and we're realistic and we're not looking for someone to just make us feel better we're mm -hmm. looking for teachings and teachers and, and and spiritual friends but we're not looking for someone else to fix us and that's a big, yeah. a big difference. Yeah. And as teachers, we don't want to, 
encourage that kind of thinking in, in people that are around us. We want them to, to know that the healing that's going on or the, you know, when someone goes into a deeper meditation, mm -hmm. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. It's not me, right? Mm -hmm. It's them. Something is opening up in them and, and, and people are finding their way into deeper stillness. And I might be in the neighborhood. I might be part of that. I might've been, you know, sitting with them or teaching them tools or, or helping mm -hmm. them understand the mind or all those different things. But that's not me. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing that's helpful too. Yeah. And then, you know, we get into the whole awareness and consciousness and, and you know, what's moving in consciousness and who am I and, and all of those spiritual questions. And on some level that's important and on another, on another level, I don't think that's important at all. Okay. Yeah, I think by, you know, by, um, from what I see and, and in my own experience, there definitely was a, a time when that became a very consuming question. You know, I just had yep. to inquire into that until I really found for myself who I was. Right, yeah. And, you know, and these days it's, kind of it's done you know it's like right. yeah yeah i don't you know it's not an all-consuming question anymore right um but it definitely was at a point and and it is and it can become that all-consuming question for people when the time is right open a you know? lot of doors yeah 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 so lynn we're kind of almost at the end of our time together and we haven't talked about the healing and the spiritual journey yet and i was just struck and maybe we can that's kind of a way into that topic i was just struck by something you said about um people needing to be discerning mm -hmm. in terms of their relationship with a spiritual teacher and you know i think the same is true um in terms of a healing journey that's happening in relation to a therapist you know and in both journeys there is a stage when that discernment isn't quite possible you know because there's such a need right. to to receive something you know to receive guidance, spiritual guidance, or to receive the love that we didn't have as children, we, we didn't receive as children, the, the care, the concern, the, you know, the presence of an adult, right, just really just listening, you know, there's such a need to, it's almost like to, to drink that in, to receive that with all right. that we are and all that we have. And at that stage, it's not possible to be discerning, really, truly, you know, because there's so much projection and so much need mm. there. Right. And, you know, if it's good therapy and if it's good spiritual teaching, then there'll always be, you know, a, a kind of pointing back to the knowing of their own knowing, you know, one's right. own knowing. Right. Yeah. Um, and and relying on that, relying on whatever feels true mm -hmm. in us. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but that in itself, to, to to come to trust that, that in itself is a journey, you know, it's not there from the start. Yeah. Well, and you know, as a as a person who helps people with trauma, I'm not a physiotherapist. Not a physiotherapist, that's for sure. I'm not a psychotherapist either. So I'm not a, a psychologist or anything like that. The process that I use is mindfulness inquiry mm -hmm. and you know, a healing nervous system and knowledge about trauma, that kind of thing. But the really important thing is, is that we all need someone that we can feel safe with mm -hmm. and connected with. So it's this attuned empathy. It's um, being able to say, this is who I am. This is how I feel. Um, and to not be shamed for that. So much of healing is healing the shame of, you know, of our human life and of the, 
the disconnection and not being connected with people as we were growing up, especially. But also, there's so much abuse and hurt, and and we really need a safe place to land. And for a while, I know exactly what you mean, but we we might not have that discernment for a while. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, we're with we're with someone who isn't going to abuse that. But yeah. we have a lot of resistance come up. We might get mad at them for a while or something. But but to to be able to feel like that person is really just here to be present with us and to mm-hmm. let us experience that safety. And that is what helps people to heal. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'm always pointing people back to, is there kindness here for yourself right now? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that energy in your body, is that familiar? Mm-hmm. Um, is there a sense of an age? People say, yeah, when I was five, this happened. Mm-hmm. And can you connect with that five-year-old? Mm-hmm. and 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 really experience the closeness so you're not disconnected anymore now you're connected right mm-hmm. and and that is a therapeutic relationship whether it's with a teacher a therapist or whoever it's with and the idea of that is to build the capacity to be present with ourselves mm-hmm. and so i think as long as that's happening and that can take a few years it can take several years mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. And as someone who, you know, I've healed a lot of my trauma and I have a pretty stable mind now, I can be present with someone without manipulating them or without needing mm-hmm. approval. Or And if something like yeah. that comes up, then I notice it and I can, I can work with it. I know how to work with that, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what we need. So we need that consistency, but always with the kind of trajectory of we're working toward being able to provide that for ourselves. Yeah. And we're the ones who, no matter what else is going on, when we can trust ourselves, that's mm-hmm. the real freedom and the mm-hmm. real healing. And then as those things that obscure our own basic goodness fall away and they're healed, then then we can just be present with that, you know? Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. So in reflecting on your own healing and spiritual journey, is there something else that maybe you feel you want to um, share with us that feels important or share with people also? Right. Something that might be helpful. I think there's a few things that are, are kind of a foundation. One is that we, it's very helpful to know how our system works to just acknowledge we live in a body that has survival brain and all of that stuff. We're mammals Mm -hmm. and and that we might not want to be mammals. We might not want to have a nervous system that's hyper vigilant, but in fact, if that's what we have, that's what we have. Mm -hmm. So it's very helpful to know how that works so that we have some optimism that we can heal. And also that we're not always just resisting what it is that's going on. And that the mind is, is actually possible to understand and heal the mind Mm -hmm. and not the brain in the head necessarily, although that's part of it, but, you know, to, to keep going into our heart and what does the heart know and to, to do this really embodied work. And, you know, through my own healing and through the people that I've worked with and lots of other people, I know that this is possible. So Mm -hmm. I have that, have that confidence that if we put in this work, that it's actually going to have some benefit and our mind will be freer we won't have so many compulsions you know Mm -hmm. and that if we could do one thing and one thing only it would be to be kind Mm -hmm. to be kind with ourselves and have that have a kind compassionate patient relationship with ourselves Mm -hmm. and you know that relationship with ourselves isn't kind of a out there in here it's a very much you know it's a very intimate witnessing it's right inside of us and that's what we really, um, that's what we come to, mm-hmm. is knowing that in fact everything's fine, and that we, you know, we heal that shame that used to drive us, and you know, the the fear in our body that used to keep us, you know, kind of agitated all the time. All that stuff can heal, mm-hmm. and that it's really possible for everybody. I really know that in every mm-hmm. cell of my body, I know that we can all heal, and yes. that we. Can, Experience that depth of connection and stillness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's 
it's worth that's it. That's great. That's a that's yeah. a great way to end. Thank thank you so much, Lynn. And yeah, you know, I totally you. agree with you. Yes, it is possible to heal. And ultimately, you know, my sense is that that's where the healing and the spiritual journeys really join hands. Is in that coming to ourselves. Yes. so intimately that there's nothing more to object to there's nothing more to mm -hmm. you know resist or mm -hmm. you know then it's just what's here and it's perfect you know it's beautiful yeah that's that's what is there's a saying in our tradition ever pure ever wise ever free mm -hmm. i remember the first time i heard that i'm like oh Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then you know, we gradually live into that more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lynn. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk about this and, yeah. and to have a chat with you about it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I just want to say, um, if people want to connect with Lynn, um, her website is lynnfraserstillpoint.com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Here and we are. Thanks again. Yeah, everything I do is on there the courses and, you know, YouTube channel and all of that yeah. stuff is on there. So it's a good okay. place to go. Yeah. And anybody who would like to, to join us for the daily practice, it's at 8 a.m. Eastern. It's free. I'm there every day. And you're welcome to come. That would be mm -hmm. great. Yeah, that's a great offering. Then. Yeah. So thank you again. And um, thank you for sharing, you know, sharing your journey so, so openly. And, and um, I'm sure, I hope it will be helpful for others in whatever whatever they need to hear about it yeah well thank you so thanks again <laughs>